Hey everyone, today we'll be talking about anomaly detection on the server side and what that means is we'll be managing the health of this system, trying to figure out if at any point of time this system is in trouble. The way we do that is by having all of these servers publish the metrics which are important to us. And instead of the server figuring out whether this is good or bad, what it does is that it publishes these metrics to a particular engine. Now the whole purpose of this engine is to make sure that the health of the system is good by detecting anomalies. At any point of time, if you see an anomaly, what you should be doing is flagging that and sending an alert to a systems engineer. One of the key points of anomaly detection on the server side is to allow false positives a lot more than allowing false negatives. What I mean by that is the cost of an engineer investigating a false alert is much cheaper than the cost of a real alert being missed out by this engine. So that's the way that we'll be designing this system. The first thing we need to do if we are managing the infrastructure here is to allow some sort of uniformness and standard way in which all of these services can publish their metrics to this engine. Yeah, this is probably the profile service, this is probably a session service, this is the payment service, they all have their own metrics. And if you ask people to send us important metrics, there's different things which are important to different services. One way that you can achieve this is an infrastructure change uh, and that is by implementing a service mesh which involves a sidecar. A sidecar in a microservice architecture is something that handles a lot of common functionalities. For example, you have routing. Uh, if S2 is sending a message to S4, it figures out the IP address of the box on S4 where it needs to send the message in a particular way. S3 to S1 is the same way. So that logic is the same. You can actually code that logic into a sidecar. Uh, similarly, parsing messages. So all of these guys are going to be sending each other messages probably over HTTP, probably over some protocol you have written over TCP. What you can do then is just pass the message in the same way on all services, but you don't want to be writing that code in every microservice. You want to shift that onto a library and that library can be part of a bigger library called a sidecar. And this is perfect. If the sidecar exists, then it's going to be taking these metrics from every application and then publishing that to this engine without uh, any dependency on any team to actually get into this. Now comes the interesting bit. We are going to be trying to find anomalies in this time series data. As a human being, you can look at this graph and immediately say that there's an anomaly over here. Yeah, it's quite easy actually for a human being to do that. But when you try to code this uh, as, a, as an engineer, the first reaction that we have is there's some extremes that we want to cap off. You want to put in limits over here. So maybe one of the good limits to put is over here. Anything beyond this is an anomaly. Similarly, anything beyond this is an anomaly. And now this can be done using the historical data that you have, figuring out what is the mean, what is the maximum variance, or you can do it in a brute force way. All you need to do is just pick any arbitrary value and you start seeing anomalies everywhere. As you can guess, this is very prone to errors. One thing it doesn't take into consideration is the overall trend of a graph. For example, if things are going down and this is happening for months, when you have a low pass filter, what's going to happen is it's going to hit that low pass filter and you'll immediately think it's an anomaly while this has been going on for months. To avoid that kind of problem, we can keep a dynamic low pass and high pass filter. And this sticks close to the graph. What this does is that if there's a very sharp change in the, uh, in the metric, then it's going to be flagged as an anomaly. The reason for that is because when there's a sharp change, the low pass and high pass filter are not expecting a very sharp change, they're going pretty close to the graph and it hits that low pass filter over here. Immediately it can be marked as an anomaly and this can be sent to an engineer who's looking into this. The only drawback here is that you're not taking into consideration time. For example, this is the 25th of December. There's a massive spike because everyone is buying gifts through your website uh, and once it's over, there's a crash and maybe this is New Year. What you can do is you can take previous year's data and see that the change was dramatic during 25th. Therefore, this is not an anomaly, it's normal. There's a lot of algorithms which find anomalies in a series of data, especially time series data. And uh, I have listed a lot of them in the description below. The one that we'll be talking about is a very promising one, which is called an isolation tree. 
An isolation tree is basically a decision tree. Uh, a decision tree, you can assume it to be making decisions based on the inputs that you have. So for example, uh, if you have your age, which is greater than 50, and you have good health, then you buy a house. Otherwise, you buy health insurance. And this is basically a very narrow way in which you can think of making decisions, right? You, you basically make inferences that this person is buying this because of these inputs. The most important thing to notice is that we are partitioning the data based on certain features. Initially, we have age, then depending on what comes next, it might be you're less than 25, then nationality, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is based on the information entropy it has. You can have a look in the description below for more details. But you're seeing that we are trying to make decisions based on partitioning data into pieces. With this idea, what we can do is we can try to partition the data such that in the minimum number of cuts, we are able to get something which is extreme, which is an outlier. That's what an anomaly is. For example, if your age is less than 10, you probably buy nothing at any given point of time, or maybe all the time action figures or something like that. What if age less than 10, you end up buying a house? I'm assuming that the number of partitions required on the data to set you apart is going to be really, really low. That also means that you are an anomaly. That's what the isolation tree is based on, or on principle. And if you run your time series data through the isolation tree, you should be able to find such anomalies using this kind of a pattern. So this is a brief introduction of what anomaly detection is like on the server side. Uh, important points to notice are that we are more forgiving for false alerts rather than, you know, false positives rather than false negatives. Uh, another thing to notice is that we want some sort of uniformity in the sampling rate, uniformity in what we are measuring. So all those metrics are sent through a sidecar onto an analytical engine. This analytical engine can be using multiple machine learning models to figure out anomalies. That's the machine learning bit. One of the interesting algorithms is isolation trees. If you have any doubts or suggestions on this, you can leave them in the comments below. If you liked the video, then hit the like button. And if you want notifications for further videos like this, hit the subscribe button. I'll see you next time.